inevitable to be third world when your name has been extracted from your tongue and its gravitas unearthed from your mind. With fragments in our hands, attempted recreating beauties lost to the sleeping moon, Africa. You are the essence of innovation and origin of civilization. How have you forgotten the root of all life? The first human words were spoken by you. You cradled mathematics, rocked navigation, pressed paper from papyrus reed, burped pyramids. We're visionaries before we were accredited, so we exhale the future. Exponential innovation and thinking for you was not a program incubated in a hub. It was your communal daily bread, imagination, the language with which we spoke to each other. Fear irrelevance brewed by old knowledge. Fall in love with the future you have not kissed. Set your own table before the world. Deck it with your own systems. Feast on your force to drape descendants with a power. Not all that is foreign is greater than your own. Hone your force. Own your ish. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, and that was the poet uh, for the month, Emma Mabie, and we thank her for her beautiful poem, which will be shared throughout the month. Uh, I'd just like to welcome all of you who are here with us today. I think some people will continue joining us, uh, but we have a full program and a lot, oh, sorry, that we want to share. So I think we'll just jump right into it. My name is Geshi Karuri Sabina. Uh, I am not your speaker for, the, for today, I'm really just here to you up. Uh, but basically, I'm part of the Civic Tech Innovation Network and an associate of South African Cities Network, uh, who are, among others, uh, co-sponsoring, uh, co-hosting this uh, Urban Month. Uh, with the sponsorship that we have from Illuminate and the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, uh, we're really delighted today to have the first in our series of what we're calling the Smarter Cities series. Uh, we hope you'll join sessions throughout the month. Uh, they'll be at the same time, same day, not necessarily the same place. There'll be different links. Uh, but the series begins with consciousness today, goes on to imagination, participation, and then action. I very briefly wanted to maybe say why we are doing this session and series. Uh, for many of us, I don't think uh, you're unaware that uh, the idea of the smart city has often been sort of contentious and framed in ways that can sometimes feel alienating. Uh, to us, uh, or even perhaps seeming to perpetuate some rather uh, troubling tre trends in sort of conventional development. So for many of us, I think there have been questions about what does smart cities mean. Uh, and so what we thought we would do for this month is take a slightly different tact, you know, ask different questions about what it means for our cities to be smarter, starting from the philosophical, going to the mental, the social, uh, uh, and then finally to asking what this means for policy and action. So we hope you'll engage throughout the month and we hope it will be an interesting time. Today, we have an unusual speaker in our midst. You know, typically we'll have our usual uh, urban design speakers or our domain technologists talking about smart cities. Uh, Anuraj Gambir is somebody I met clear across the world uh, <laughs> about half a year ago. Uh, and he's an internationally recognized exponential thought leader, uh, strategic business startup advisor, and, and a technology visionary. Um, what I can say from my, the time I've known him is that he's a full-on tech geek <laughs> uh, with many, many direct involvements in cutting edge sort of technology development, commercialization, and that sort of thing. But what really attracted me to him is what I'm thinking is that somehow he manages to make connections to deeper questions about our consciousness, our spirituality, the kind of leaders we want to be, the kinds of questions we ask as we think about development. So we thought this would be a good start that we'll both do a little bit of feeding our tech fetish, uh, but also balancing it with these concerns uh, and societal issues we have around humanity, exclusion, the planet. Uh, and I think you'll find that he has his own way of sense making between these tensions. Uh, I hope you'll be talking to us today about his new sci-fi series to come, The White Mirror, which we are all very excited about. Uh, I hope we'll get to hear a little bit about that. W among all of that, he also happens to be a smart city enthusiast. But again, I think you'll find he takes a broader view on it at different scales, uh, and we'll be hearing a bit about that. Uh, we'll share his links so that you can follow up on him. But what's most important is that we have the man in person here. So without further ado, 
I'd like to hand over to Anuraj. We won't read through his whole bio. I think I've told you enough and we'll share the links. So let's maximize our time with him. Uh, in terms of the session and how we hope to run it, uh, we've got a bit of time, uh, uh, 90 to 120 minutes. Uh, what we will do is, uh, he has plenty of content and we've invited him to spend much of the first hour really sharing that. Uh, although he is quite open to being interrupted, uh, I've told him maybe he doesn't know South Africans very well. We will take over his presentation if he's not careful. So we'll probably allow him to largely go through his content. But I would like to welcome all of you to actively use the chat, raise questions, make comments. Uh, we'll definitely have time in the second hour to come back to that uh, and have more of an engagement with Anuraj. So without further ado, Anuraj, I'd like to welcome you to take the stage. For those of you who are not familiar with um, Zoom, you can, you can go to his image and click on the three dots on top uh, and you'll be able to pin him as the main speaker if you don't want to look at uh, 30 faces instead of the speaker. So feel free to do that. Anuraj, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Keshi. It's a great pleasure. I'm just sharing my screen here. So hi, everyone. Um, hello from uh, beautiful Sydney. Well, it's uh, 11 o'clock at night here. But, Anuraj, uh, there's a bit of an echo. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll turn the volume down in my other one. I hope that's better now. Much so, better, uh, yes. Okay, great. Excellent. So I'll be covering, um, let me go through some of my outline of the uh, talk. As uh, you know, Geshe said that I've got a lot of content. <clears throat> really be covering, you know, quite a broad area of the consciousness sort of elements of a future smart city. And uh, I wanted to start with some key mega trends, which I'm sure many of you are probably aware of, so I might be whizzing past some of them, but feel free to stop me at any moment. I'll go through some uh, aspects of fusion of technologies in um, smart cities and communities. And I think in smart cities, I want to be very inclusive. It's very much talking about uh, you know, rural elements or smart um, you know, living, uh, smart being as a whole. And I think it's all about where humanity resides in general. That's where we are trying to uplift and elevate to a new level. And I'll talk about a bit about big data, how that's a very key facet of how we can influence the design of smart cities and then go into a little bit of uh, interconnectivity across different industries, the fact of transdisciplinarity, and then look at uh, this sort of key topic around where technology and uh, spirituality intersect to really look at a future awakened consciousness for uh, the exponential mindset, and then some key takeaways. So without further ado, let me get started with some key megatrends that I'm sure you've heard of VUCA. So the world, at the, certainly at this moment in time too, we're very much all experiencing it being volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I'll revert back to this with the new VUCA later on towards the end of my presentation, which is what I think we all want to head towards. So I've actually got three uh, exponential buzzwords or, co or uh, terms that I'd coined over three decades of my career. And I've actually got a fourth one, which I'm just announcing soon and, and uh, putting that forward, which we can certainly discuss later on. And it's to do with the, actually the, la the latter part of my presentation around consciousness very much. So the first one was when I worked in the mobile industry in the telecommunication space called Simplexity, which was very much as mobile phones in the early days were you know, obviously a lot of complex technology and electronics put together. And it was all about hiding that technology and enabling the benefits for the user. Because I think Murphy's law, we've all known the 80-20 rule where 80% of the people use less than 20% of the features or functionality on a mobile device. So it was during that time when I worked quite a bit on the design of mobile devices and then later on in smartphones, feature phones and then smartphones. It was about how do we make complex things simple? and really hide that complexity to enable the, simplex the simplicity and the benefits of it. The second one was around collaboration. So it was my career of say 15 odd years of being chief innovation officer for many large corporates and organizations around the world where it was so much about the openness and collaborative deep collaboration around bringing innovation, which what true innovation is very much about anyway. But we can elaborate a bit more on that as we go along. And then the third one, which has been more recent in the last six, seven years, has been more around experiation, where I've done a fair bit of work or involvements with immersive media, uh, more specifically augmented virtual reality, mixed reality, which I'll be talking a little bit later on about. And that's where we see that movement from 
um, old school storytelling to immersive story showing, or what I even take it further saying story living, story being, and, uh, and, and in that level. So, so we're living in this hyper-connected world of the empowered customer. Even Time Magazine back in 2007 awarded us, you, we, the person of the year. So, um, and we've all very much, I'm sure, aware of the four industrial revolutions that we have been witnessing over the um, uh, few um, you know, centuries, the recent centuries, which is industry 1.0, you know, basically starting from mechanization, electrification, automation, and now it's more the unification and really being the intelligent, uh, you know, next level of automation with um, fusion of various technologies like IoT, AI, big data, blockchain, AR, VR, uh, robotics, synthetic biology, and so forth. So the exponential technologies, as we call it. But what we're really seeing is with something which has not been formally been announced is really the Industrial Revolution 5.0, which is actually where humanity comes in a lot more closer to the technology. And we talk about this being the, uh, well, the cooperation between man and machine, as they call it. And it's that harmonization of intelligent uh, you know, networks, computing, but very much putting humanity at the forefront of how that personalization is really coming about. And I think I'll be touching on various points along this for as we explore the smart city of the future. Some of the key uh, interesting mega trends which uh, Gartner talks about and are revealed through the hype cycle, which I'm sure many of you would have again seen, but we really see things like, um, you know, uh, explainable AI and so many other elements like AR, VR, of course, which have crossed the chasm. And now we're seeing a lot more early, you know, adapters of, uh, you know, technologies like the, the two-way BMI, the brain machine interface, which I'll again be talking about a bit later around consciousness. And uh, we see some of those taking on board very rapidly. And of course, AI has so many different manifestations, you know, from machine learning, deep learning, uh, you know, cognitive, adaptive, composite, generative, and embedded AI, explainable AI, like I was saying. So all that has certainly gone through quite an evolution also. And some of them at a very early stage, and of course, quantum computing, and um, other first further you know developments that are out there and then we also talk about agi which of course is at a very early stage but in 2029 and then 2045 are certainly the years we to watch out for when we talk about it uh, you know surpassing sort of human intelligence as they say as uh, ray kurzweil talks about it now here's a whole bunch of information about various technologies which are the top few for the coming decade obviously ai IoT, uh, you know, the mobile social internet, blockchain, big data, automation, the usual suspects, but I think it's an interesting, um, you know, explanation here. I'm just going to pass through that. Um, something which I really, uh, you know, focus on and tell companies or, you know, people to very much consider is that breakdown of which horizons that they're working on and to really balance it out because a lot of people get stuck with the operational, uh, you know, horizon one, the now, which is very important, of course, to focus on but I think you've got to look ahead and look at new products, services, and that's where kind of the incremental to a more disruptive innovation sort of phase comes in. But then look, looking at what we call moonshots at Singularity U is really where we talk about Horizon 3, which is more high risk, but very high impact. But we're talking about multiple X uh, product creation value or value creation really uh, potential there. And what really is happening is we, we definitely tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run, but underestimate it in the long run. And I think it's a great saying by Roy Amara, who's put that forward, and we continuously sort of notice that um, across the board. Now, with the pace of change, uh, what we notice here, and uh, I know the picture's a little bit not that clear, but what you're seeing here is actually the, um, the, the horse and cart, um, you know, uh, dominated in, in the 1900. Whereas the motor car, you just see one of them, but in 13 years, it was displaced uh, so rapidly in Fifth Avenue, New York. So we're really talking about that moving shift from linear to exponential. And I think what could be a better time or rather uh, moment, you know, where we are certainly, I think even the layman understands what exponential growth is about. Unfortunately, as we've seen with the pandemic, we're all under witnessing um, that growth has been quite exponential. And, uh, you know, we've seen technologies obviously are going through that phase. And what I'll be talking about is building that exponential mindset to actually keep up with that and to go ahead of it. 
So we really noticed that as we move through the early phase of deception, we, uh, you know, everything looks very linear fashioned, but it's the knee of that curve. Once we surpass that, that's when it really takes off. And it goes so fast that it's very hard to comprehend. And I think Roy, Roy Mara is saying what I mentioned earlier is very valid then. So if I ask you that, uh, or mention that, you know, if you take 31 meter steps, you've traveled how many? 30 meters, right? But if you take 30 exponential steps, can I ask how many, how much you would have traveled? Does anybody want to quickly unmute and say, uh, give a quick answer? Okay, maybe I will, uh, I'll, I'll just skip to the next slide then. <laughs> it's a billion meters and it's 26 times around the earth. So uh, that's what 30 exponential steps is. So it's, it's a very large number, as you can see, you know, it's um, quite a bit of, uh, you know, growth potential there. Uh, what we talk about at Singularity University is the six Ds, you know, which is anything that can be digitized, goes through a phase of deception, disruption, can be dematerialized, demonetized, and eventually democratized. And um, so it's no longer about uh, creating ecosystems, it's about curating them. And, you know, my own uh, experience and work has been in various different industries, primarily the telecom industry, the media, the internet, and the uh, you know, IT sort of space. And really it's that fusion and convergence, but then as it sort of proliferated across so many domains, it's been um, quite an explosion of you know, transdisciplinarity, as I call it, areas. And what we're also noticing is that shifting centers of innovation globally, you know, from west to east and from internal to collaborative. And I certainly was uh, part of my career where I spent quite some time in the West, but also setting up innovation labs, uh, centers of excellence for companies like Ericsson and so forth, and as their first, you know, distributed uh, polycentric hub of innovation in India, uh, beyond the, the, you know, the Stockholm, which was their headquarters and the, the prime, uh, you know, center for innovation. So I think we're really seeing that happen across the board. And another key trend, which, you know, a lot of my work in emerging markets and certainly in Africa, you know, I'm sure you have a similar term to this. In India, we call it Jugaad innovation, which is really thinking frugal, uh, you know, and it's what it is about is really creating maximum value with minimal resources. And uh, Jugaad actually term comes from a, you know, a, a old rural Indian transport vehicle, uh, kind of a multi-purpose utility vehicle. And I'm sure in Africa, there are a lot of parallels to that. I've certainly done a bit of work in West Africa and Nigeria spent some time there. And I think there's some great cross learnings in this uh, philosophy of Jugaad and frugal innovation or something uh, called reverse innovation, which the West and Professor Vijay Govindrajan, who has done a fair bit of work in that. In fact, it inspired a lot of great innovation. And one of them is actually the Tata Nano, which was a, a two and a half thousand dollar car, um, you know, which was launched several years ago in India. And uh, it was actually a key insight, which was observed by, uh, you know, Mr. Tata himself, uh, Ratan Tata, the, the ex-chairman, and uh, of, you know, the safety that, the lack of safety he saw of people being in a, on a moped or on a, on a motorcycle or, you know, a whole family traveling on that. So if he wanted to reinvent the car from scratch and it was really looking at, you know, how do we look at the design to cost, look at not compromising safety, but really bringing about that whole revolution of, uh, you know, frugal to uh, innovation, which was then democratized to that level. Um, the next area I wanted to quickly mention was about the education space, because I've been doing a fair bit of work in that area too, um, you know, teaching and, and uh, mentoring and, and involved with the various different courses and defining courses with the business schools and, and uh, entities like that. So transforming old school, we've really seen that shift happen from, it's no longer about a sage on the stage, but being a guide on the side. And we've seen tens of thousands of MOOCs. And of course, many of them have become so popular now because of the online revolution and everything going digital and, and uh, you know, being connected. And I think what we're seeing with those massively online open courses, which universities now, even organizations and many other entities have been launching has created that approach to entire connectivity of next level education and, and lifelong learning is what we call it. And the flipped classroom is something I adopted many years ago. It's really about where students coming into the class, uh, you know, spend more time collaborating on solving problems and doing real case studies rather than just studying theory. 
So it's something which I was quite involved with at this business school, which was a global business school where we had a global MBA program with students from uh, Mumbai. Uh, well, actually, uh, you know, spending time in uh, the campus in Mumbai, Dubai, Singapore, and Sydney, and then actually immersing in those markets and getting real life experience with a very interesting course. But also we had great online learning uh, engaged classroom with, as you can see here, uh, set up many years ago, in fact, which has become so popular now. Other key trend in education we notice is the move from STEM to STEAM to STEAM. So it's entrepreneurship, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, which I think the students of the future really need to um, you know, embrace. So one key project I was involved with, with the Indian government, and it's something which I certainly also took to Africa later, was the design of a, a very low cost tablet. In fact, it was the world's lowest cost tablet at that time at $35. And this is about 12 years ago when we worked on this project with the Indian government and with Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, that we came up with uh, a whole team and learning from computer, one laptop per child, and coming up with uh, a design to cost approach, but it was very much around the totality of that experience that we built around it. Because even with an order of 100 million odd units, the first iteration uh, you know, didn't make it to that level, but it was more when we considered the total experience, which is that function of hardware, software, content and services, that we could really take it to the next level. So aimed at students, in the K-12 sort of uh, uh, you know, curriculum and looking at uh, how do we connect and bring digital India at that time to the next level. We um, actually I brought on board one of the key startups which had a great app for children and it was taking pen pals to a digital format and it was making children into global citizens. So um, it's a great app called Touchable Earth from uh, New Zealand and I'll just play a quick video on that one to Thank you, here. Touchable Earth is the first digital world book for kids, where kids are the teachers. That means when Neo and Rathabile in Lesotho, Africa, want to learn about girls' clothes in Nepal, they can learn from a child their own age who actually lives there. Namaste, my name is Divya Kartka. I am 11 years old. All the months wear this type of dress in Nepal and I am going to explain this dress. This is Jolie, this is Dhoti, this is Patukti, this is Mala, this is Sirbandi, these are Dhuris, this is Tika. Thank you. Bye. Key facts about each place are covered, but more importantly, so are aspects of a kid's life, such as their family, <laughs> their school day, the games that they play, and their culture. The similarities foster curiosity, as does the opportunity to share and learn with somebody their own age. Well, we see them and they see us. Yes, and all over the world. Our goal is to have every place in the world included in Touchable Earth. We have partnered with the largest schools network in the world, iEarn.org to help create the content. We aim to be the leading donor of tablets for education. We have successfully donated tablets and wireless internet to schools in South Africa, Romania, Iraqi Kurdistan, India, Nepal, and Yemen. Supporting Touchable Earth helps us create new chapters, foster peer learning, and increase access to education around the world. Yeah, so as you saw there, you know, it was really about how do we make kids into that global citizen uh, sort of format with what's meaningful in their lives, with their schools, their family, their friends, and their local being in their local habitat. Uh, so similarly, we're seeing that democratization happen in healthcare, and another domain which has been close to my heart actually, looking at really more wellness and healthcare in that regard, and I think it's. Um, a great uh, book that Eric Topol had written, The Patient Will See You Now, and subsequent other articles in that, which was really about self-help health, and what we're really noticing that shift from diagnostic to preventative, from sick care to what we really call the true health care, onto self-care. And uh, I think this is where we're really seeing that 
it's the self-help health areas which has become and you know health is really the true wealth as we know it's all about how do we look after ourselves a lot more than even the system has to and i think all these are key facets of a human centric smart city and a smart city is something which is really like a living organism we are call it it's really all those interlinkage domains of transportation healthcare education energy all of them sort of coming together to formulate the government obviously being a, a key inviting force and then it's all about the private public partnerships that need to come about in the right optimal manner to bring that intelligence but it's a lot more than that because it's i think the consciousness of the smart city which sort of bring comes up so in terms of technology we talk about you know internet of things or as cisco says internet of everything or internet of uh, you know uh, well medical things is another term which has come about um, we talk about um, you know internet of uh, there's so many other sort of related terms in that space but i think it's when we look at that in terms of safety security agriculture building management so many other facets that move from smart living smart architecture uh, infrastructure and then moving into facets like telemedicine and healthcare and then more into machine to machine or wireless sensors you know because i think it's really the sensors and we're talking about a trillion sensors just in a matter of half a more decade coming about it's really about a lot more data more control and uh, that's going to enable a lot more facets of what we call the explosion into that tactile internet which is a lot more closer to touching on on human benefits you know directly right from wearables which i'll be talking a bit more about right through to you know looking at automated logistics and uh, traffic management and industry 4.0 sort of coming together to enable a lot of new virtual related services and uh, augmenting us with in terms of intelligence so here's another little diagram i had about a, a future sort of a, a smart city more from a technology perspective where you've got telecommunications and you've got various technologies like 5g iot you've got industrial sort of elements with iiot was the term i was looking for earlier industrial internet of things with ge has been dubbing um, we talk about transportation with um, auto autonomous capability electrification that is a, a key mega trend and of course in healthcare we talk about that prescriptive and internet of medical things and telemedicine and cloud which is where big data analytics edge and fog analytics sort of enables a whole new sort of facet and then we've got a key facet of what we call the city brain or ai and cyber security has to play a, play a very key role in that so um with the fusion of technologies i think there's an interesting way to put it forward is data is the new oil ai is the new electricity iot is the new nervous system and i think that's kind of what we're noticing there with cloud and uh, 5g iot all of this sort of coming together to formulate uh, new uh, you know use cases and benefits within a smart city and then we've got elements like uh, you know the natural user interface with the ift protocol if this then that you can enable a lot more contextual services which are you know automating things in your home or as you're driving transiting from one mode to another and i'll give you an example of that in also in a few minutes of a startup that i've been mentoring um and i think with data as we know with there's such an explosion happening out there just in one minute or 60 seconds right we see 1.3 million people have logged into facebook 19 million text messages um you know 1400 downloads uh, of, uh, and then you know just so much happening in terms of the uh, you know 764000 hours of netflix watched in just 60 seconds so it's quite uh, humongous in terms of the the creation of data and we're talking about 2.8 plus exabytes of data being generated every single day but you know that data means nothing unless we do something with it and i think it's all about how do we create the right insights and how do we take the subsequent big actions from it so it's really moving from that phase of descriptive to diagnostic to predictive to prescriptive analytics so there's uh, you know we're really drowning in information but and what we start for knowledge as john naspit says very nicely and that's where it's about how do we convert that data into meaningful information and then subsequently into real true wisdom that can be of great value for us so in transportation that's what we're seeing there's so much data being generated in that space we're talking about the connected car with vehicle to anything communications within the vehicle and outside the vehicle and uh, you know there's a, a startup called gofar that i've been mentoring 
And what they've really done is every car built out of after June of 2006 has an OBD2 port, what we call an onboard diagnostics port, which is almost like a USB port in the car. And you can plug in this dongle and make that car pretty much into a smart car. So it actually measures the various things from the, and gets the data from the car ECU, from the computer. And you, you're getting various driver information, driver behavior information, how the vehicle is performing, its drag coefficient and so forth. But you can actually control also various facets and then actually gamify that so that you can actually uh, you know, see how well somebody is driving and improve their driving even over time. And it's all based on obviously data and analytics there. But what we're seeing is with the future of automobility, uh, there are so many new use cases which are coming about with autonomous transport and you know, what a vehicle can be used for. And uh, this was actually the Mercedes F15, which uh, happened to be at the launch of in Shanghai at CES uh, many years ago. And uh, you know, again, two years ago at CES, Toyota showcased this e-palette multi-purpose moving space, which could be morphed or adapted for so many different situations. Uh, for ride sharing, for logistics, for transportation, for um, you know delivery uh, and so forth. And but again, all this automation of uh, you know happening in the vehicle is creating a lot of data, and there are so many touch points there, which um, you know Intel talks about, you know basically 4,000 gigabytes per day, uh, you know per uh, or, you know autonomous vehicle that is being generated. A lot of it obviously coming from the lidar and from the uh, you know, capabilities to measure and to to uh, keep it safe and uh, the different sensors that it has on board. And what we're seeing with data, again, another startup in the energy space that I was uh, mentoring is uh, been looking at AI, uh, you know, where it's really touching on a lot more hu human elements of technology. So what cost is about intelligent living? It's really what they do is They've got a, a smart sensor, of basically this box you see here, which uh, you know sits right next to the your normal meter, and it makes your you know utility meter into a smart sort of uh, measurement tool, and they get a spectral fingerprint of every appliance, uh, you know energy fingerprint pretty much of uh, uh, of every appliance which is in the house, and with that we're able to sort of see um, you know how what is the optimal time to use that appliance, for example, to, for best energy savings, but also go into deeper learning capabilities and provide personalized smart home understandings. But what's interesting is actually when you cross across this capability in other industries areas, such as in um, looking at in the healthcare space. So if grandma, for example, did not turn on the kettle at eight o'clock in the morning, as one use case, it could send an alert. And then it could, you could interlink that with other sensors in the house to look at, uh, you know, age care, for example, living, and if there's a fall detection sort of capability, and then of course, the, you know, smart video analytics based, which is based on cameras and, and imaging sensors, there's a lot of uh, potential to integrate this with um, and make it a lot more uh, capable. So as I was saying earlier, it's really that uh, you know, moving from hindsight to foresight is what the capability that data can move into as Gartner talks about from descriptive to prescriptive analytics. And uh, another interesting facet of smart cities is looking at, um, you know, or some great experimentation that Google, which has this, um, you know, had, uh, bought, uh, taken over this company called Sidewalk Labs, had a great setup in Toronto. And uh, what they've done is actually looking at a, a lot more human driven elements of affordability, sustainability, and you know, driving economic op opportunities and so forth for setting up this experimental micro city or a precinct rather. And, uh, and that has been a great learnings, I think, coming up from that, which have been proliferated across smart cities. Because again, smart cities is, is the term has been very loosely used. You know, there's, it can mean a lot more infrastructure driven in certain markets. Whereas in the Western markets, we're talking a, a lot more next level sort of facets. And that's where I'm sort of coming from is that human centric sort of focus where all those technologies and enablements are bringing that face around. So some of the projects I've been involved with, in fact, I was uh, looking at also uh, some uh, work in uh, Hong Kong a couple of years ago, where we've been working on this um, you know, innovation precinct, the largest of its type called the Greater Bay Area, which is in Guangdong, Guangzhou, Shenzhen and Hong Kong's that sort of whole space there. 
and more recently, I've been involved with uh, the conceptualization of a future floating smart city, which is in Tasmania. And that's also based along the lines of oceanics, which is the UN habitat uh, sort of driven one. And we you know, talk about in Tasmania, which is we have a lot of great wilderness there, which is a sudden an, a great island state we have in Australia in the south. And uh, I kind of call it entrepreneurship meets wilderness or quantum meets mindset and humanity meets technology. So it's very much about the community driven approach of this floating smart city that we have been uh, conceptualizing with key domains around it, spe specifically education and healthcare. Uh, another interesting facet, obviously, we see things like in Singapore, which is a lot more, and I think that's where the learnings come out from, is about being a garden, uh, well, a city in a garden rather than a garden in a city. And I think it's up to us to choose and how we can make that. Uh, but it's about how do we bring biophilic design and that whole facet of, uh, you know, uh, outside in, in that regard. So, um, sorry, just trying to change screen there so what you see actually behind me is this uh, in fact the image also on my on my slide is a uh, Atlas atlassian's headquarters new headquarters which have been built in sydney and what this image is is of the um of this uh, you know hybrid timber design the first of its kind 40-story building which will be part of a tech precinct and actually a tech hub by the australian government here in sydney and this building is uh, going to be ready in uh, just uh, under five years now and it's going to be a very unique sort of biophilic driven uh, design, you know, smart building of its type. Some other key learnings that we notice are from the blue zones of the world. And I think if you know there, you know, there are five of these around the world. And it's all about how people live, breathe and act. And it's about, uh, you know, uh, how they, it's people living over 100, that has the largest centenarians in the world, people living over 100 years old. And those longevity hotspots are very much interlinked with the environment. And I think it has some great learnings. In fact, when we were there and Geshe was there with me, we were up in uh, beautiful Costa Rica, where they talk about the pure life, which is Pura Vida. And, uh, and this is where, you know, great learnings of biophilic and nature and, you know, that Gaia philosophy. And I think that's what I talk about very much as a key organic element of a smart city, where nature and, uh, you know, uh, flora and fauna the entire habitat sort of comes in and becomes very much that breathing essence of a smart city because nature has to play a very key role in um, in moving that forward. And one of some of my own key inspirations in this space have been, uh, you know, sacred sites, which uh, Martin Gray, uh, you know, had some great, um, uh, who actually left or renounced the world and traveled to, I think, over 60 countries and has documented um, many different facets of, uh, you know, of places uh, beyond the historical significance. So he's looked at energy and the spiritual sort of upliftment that a place gives. And uh, I was very fortunate to be in Giza at the Cheops at the King's Chamber, and we meditated up there and had a great experience in, uh, in over there about over 10 years ago now. And I think I've been following sacred sites quite a bit. And I think there's some great inspiration and triggers for smart cities uh, from places of peace and power. In that regard. So um, I wanted to move on to, well, another great learning that we've been noticing is from the Burning Man project. And I think you might have heard of uh, this great festival, or oh, it's much more than a festival that happens. In fact, we were having it over the last couple of weeks. It happened online this time, of course, but normally we've got over, I think, 70,000 people came over uh, for this event, uh, you know, a, a year last year, I think there were about 50,000, but the year before they had a, a record 70 plus thousand people coming up in Black Rock City. So a city comes up pretty much overnight for nine days in Nevada, in the desert. And uh, and it just becomes an amazing sort of festival of humanity and, and uh, great learnings from there, which come about, I think, in terms of how we share, how we sort of build our future and how we can interact and, and come up with the great ideas that we can take forward. And in fact, one of my good friends, Brian, who might be actually on this call even, who's uh, contributed quite a bit to Burning Man uh, called through this virtual reality based creation called Unity Sanctuary. And uh, he's got a great spiritual sort of experience there of a wellness temple that uh, he talks about in this space. 
And another great uh, you know, area that I've been involved with actually is uh, we've been fortunate to start something here in Sydney a couple of years ago called the Exponential Thought Leaders Bush Walk the Talk, where we get together in nature to discuss uh, you know, various big issues and including the uh, UN SDGs. So all that sort of has led me to an uh, interesting facet or a concept that I've been sort of nurturing over time uh, called White Mirror. And it was actually inspired by Black Mirror which is a series on Netflix that uh, you might have seen. And, and sort of Black Mirror is uh, very uh, powerful from you know, looking at technologies that can be deployed in the future, but it's unfortunately very dystopian. So I've sort of flipped that model and talk about moving from dystopia to utopia and how can we bring uh, you know, a lot more abundance over scarcity, reduce, remove that fear and displace it with love and really bring about uh, you know, that light from darkness and so forth. But many different facets of it are coming about. And, and I think it was an article that I triggered off earlier this year, which sort of led to a great team coming together where we've been, and I'll talk more about that a bit later, uh, maybe in the, in the interactive part, as you may have more questions about it. But it's really very much aligned to the UN SDGs that we talk about the sustainable development goals, the 17 of them, and uh, you know, very much aligning ourselves to number three, four, um, you know, well, pretty much all of them. But what we're looking at is some key elements in 17, which is partnerships and goals, really being a key part of how do we unify all of these and, and use great exponential technology and the philosophy of you know, positive psychology and things that with singularity you that we, we sort of proliferate to come together with this experience of a mindset or philosophy of white mirror. And again, a good representation of the um, UN SDGs here in a circular economy sort of format from biosphere society and economy. And I think um, some great learnings that we're seeing through um, you know, this pandemic as we're going through that well, reset, major reset or reboot as one may call it. And uh, talk about it as you know, that how can organizations of the future with the right partnerships come about as not just, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, imagine if every organization is a B Corp at the end of the pandemic coming out of the other end, where we talk much more about people, purpose uh, before profit. And I think um, what we're also seeing is some great learnings, which um, during the COVID-19, you know, in the early part, this was a great um, uh, post that came about in WhatsApp, moving from the fear zone to learning zone to growth zone. And uh, then somebody had further added an action zone to it. So I think if you can, um, and you'll certainly get access to these slides, by the way, so you'll, you'll be able to see them further. But I think how people are using this time to really utilize in the most positive manner to come beyond and, you know, because mental well being is a very critical topic, by the way, and it's something which I'll touch on in a few moments. But we've at White Mirror sort of team have sort of come up with this. Uh, next level of uh, a white mirror sort of representation of that. And we talk about the Weetopia as our key mantra within white mirror, because it's very much moving from uh, dystopia to utopia to a Weetopia, where it's about everybody. And moving from an example like, you know, people complaining at the early days of the obviously pandemic, identifying those emotions, how do we grow with the right gratitude? And then how do we look at people and planet uh, with the right action zone? So, uh, you know, you can have a look through that. Right, so might take a little pause here while I go to the next phase. If there's any, anybody, any comments or question, quick questions or something anybody has? So I don't see any raised hands right now, but maybe uh, there are a couple of interesting things in the chat. I think one that many people might be thinking about that Mohammed uh, raises is we've seen all these wonderful uses of tech but based on mm. precedent, big tech or government would use this for insidious reasons. How do we prevent this? Why should we allow tech greater access to our lives than they already have? And, and there were a few other comments along that line. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this one before, Anuraj, but what's your view on this, sort of the concern we all have about uh, uh, the mischief that <laughs> uh, follows with all of these trillion sensors you're telling us about? Yeah, obviously, you know, data is, uh, and I think people, you know, privacy is, has been redefined, obviously, in these times, I think, as, you know, every, so many organizations and governments have launched COVID apps. And, and I think it's in terms of safety and looking at security, how much of surveillance can we allow and how much of, 
you know interception of our of private data for example but i think um what i would allude to more is the social media sort of space and the social dilemma is a great by the way of something which was launched recently on netflix i'd highly recommend that as a great wake up call for what is happening out there from the likes of facebooks and the other social media giants who've been collecting data for so long and i think there's so much more of data out there for people who've been actively involved in that space um that you know it's really the governments i think are are trying to find the right balance obviously and i think it's not easy it's it varies so much from culture to culture and there are you know parts of humanity obviously which are so paranoid by uh, giving away even a, an ounce of data but i think if it's if it's wet in the right way if it's if it's you know uh, put together and and uh, openly sort of provided that what the actual use is for and that if you can control it and i think an opt in philosophies are a lot more um, you, uh, you know interesting there but we can talk more of that a bit later too yeah so good point about uh, data <laughs> Yeah. Great. Uh, do you want to take a few more, or do you want to carry on? We can come back to the questions later. Well, if, it's, if it's relating to any other thing I said before, yeah, I can take take a, a couple more. There's one that's interesting, and I think you you do have a view on. Uh, so Anand is saying that we seem to be projecting the future as primarily urban. Is anyone questioning this basic assumption or trend? Do you think the future is urban? <laughs> well, I think yeah, we, we we've seen that urbanization happen across so much in in um, uh, you know. Uh, i think that that great mega trend in emerging markets but also we seeing the reverse trend happen which is interesting and i was on a call the other day with the uh, folks in changai who were talking about how and i think we seeing that here very much too that people are moving away from the cities and i think the the growth of satellite towns which we've seen in um, asian you know places like in malaysia you know you got petaling jaya from kuala lumpur even in india from new delhi for example we've got two big satellite towns of gurgaon and noida and and i think that happens everywhere even in australia and sydney where i am we've got wollongong we've got newcastle in the north so that sort of sprawl beyond the key metropolis there are more micro metropolises sort of coming about and and micro cities and they're all being connected through this sort of hub and spoke model a lot more but i think we're seeing another shift happen across to rural whereas we see in countries like india and of course in africa the rural urban migration has been a very large dominant sort of force but i think that's slowing down to an extent in uh, in many places in fact it's reversing the way i said in in people like shanghai where the young people and uh, these were some interesting bunch of young people who did some great work with some sdgs we were talking about from our uh, singularity u leadership uh, team uh, that were actually moving out of the city to find places in rural china to to settle over there so that that's an interesting shift because obviously people don't want that pollution and now that i think we can work from anywhere and certainly the virtual connectivity that we're all experiencing is enabling that you were also speaking recently on a panel uh with uh, james uh, uh elric about uh, regenerative uh, was it, he called them regenerative cities so this idea of these uh, more less urban uh direction i suppose in terms of how he sees technology being deployed that speaks a little bit to a question that actually krishna or comment that krishna duplessis is making about uh, why do we assume the industrial revolution continues down a pathway of increasing integration of man and machine could we not have an industrial revolution that works instead towards integrating humans and nature yeah yeah no i think certainly it's it's uh, very much the cues that we are getting from you know the blue zone effect uh, as i was saying earlier and i think the regenerative work that james has been working on and certainly this uh, floating smart cities architecture we're talking about um, you know i think all of that harmonizing and and nature playing a very key role in um, in bringing about that transformation for for the urbanization and i think the concrete jungles that we've all been so used to or or you know i remember when i've been traveling to dubai for example so many times and the amount of uh, infrastructure that has been built in that in, in the middle east and specifically in dubai and abu dhabi and those sort of places has been phenomenal but i think that's where they've realized now that they need to and they've now got of course underwater townships and and uh, you know architectures and buildings and so forth coming up so and they're expanding out into the sea they've got the palms and the many other sort of uh, village type look of green spaces and re reclaimed land and and so forth which is where 
even Lagos, where I uh, stayed for some time in uh, Nigeria, in Africa, I think noticing how much, how they're actually reclaiming a lot of the land and trying to, and Banana Island, which is actually part of Lagos, is also a very green part where they're trying to make it into an oasis and, uh, you know, proliferate that across more of the metro metropolis, I think. Hmm. Yeah. So I might just continue on for now. And uh, then, so I wanted to talk about sort of variables and it's sort of this movement that I talk about as where to able, which is where it becomes a lot more meaningful because variables have really taken on the world at so many different levels. In fact, I was involved in doing a fashion show. That's when I met Keshi uh, up in Costa Rica. And it's kind of meaningful variables where we talk about things like these smart yoga tights, which is smart textiles that will enable you to, you know, perform your yoga much better. It'll, it'll quantify it and measure the right posture for you and guide you to improve it, for example. So these nat natty yoga tights are a great disruptive variable. Another great, probably I would say uh, ultimate variable uh, at the moment is somebody who we'd hosted here in Sydney called Tesla Suit. It's not to do with Tesla. It's a, a separate startup, actually a scale up very much and we've done extremely well with some great contracts and things with the space agencies like NASA. And uh, Tesla Suit is actually a full body haptic suit with climate control, biometrics, motion capture and so forth. And what they have is uh, basically ways to simulate so many different environments in virtual reality integrated in it. And now also recently launched a, a Tesla glove, Tesla suit glove, which I was at the launch at at CES in 2020 in Las Vegas early this year. So we've really pretty much got the full body covered there. And imagine being able to provide that services for firefighter training or for simulating harsh environments or for health and wellness, which is another big area that uh, Tesla suit is working on. And we've got a, a medical version of this coming about. Um, I'll play a quick video of uh, Tesla suit. So this one doesn't really have audio. Uh, I'll just speak to it. So yeah, as you can see here, um, you know, the Tesla suit is enabling a whole range of, uh, you know, haptic, into, uh, you know, experiences there. You can simulate heat, like I was saying, or cold and measure different biometrics. So you've got sensors all over the, the suit there. You've got kind of pretty much tens based uh, capability there. So you, you can feel uh, kind of almost through a low current or electromechanical uh, sort of means to look at um, getting feedback. And uh, it's it's being used in, in multiple different environments. I think, yeah, you can see here to for from gaming is pretty much where it started but looking at, uh, you know, firefighters for sports uh, and of course in medicine, like I said, and, uh, you know, helping you train in different environments and uh, simulate a whole range of different, um, you know, capabilities there. And this is the Tesla suit glove that I was talking about earlier, which is, um, uh, you know, enhancing us. And imagine you may be able to, during times of COVID right now, if I can shake hands with so Peter Diamond is sitting on the other side of the world. Um, this can enable you to do that. Another very interesting thing around uh, a kind of a conscious future vehicle that I was um, you know, involved with uh, at the launch of uh, at CES this year was with the Mercedes Benz called Vision Avatar. And it was very much with James uh, you know, uh, Cameron who was there at the launch along with the chairman of uh, Daniel Benz. Uh, you know, launching this futuristic vehicle, which is very much inspired by biophilic design, by vegan materials, by, as you can see, very much of avatar uh, elements. And I was fortunate to sort of look at the UI and the experience within the, the vehicle. And it's a full autonomous vehicle with, um, you know, everything sort of very harmonized with learnings from nature. This was the launch video, which I actually shot for an amateur video that I shot with my own camera phone. I'll just play that. Right. 
So the future is pretty much here already. It's just not evenly distributed, as says William Gibson. And I think um, it's great inspiration from these smart, um, you know, concept cars that we've seen, which have proliferated great technology showcases, something I adopted at Siemens when I was heading innovation there to really look at how do we present great new technologies um, embedded in mobile phones that, uh, you know, that can be showcased uh, coming very much from the future. Um, in terms of democratization, what we've seen is, um, you know, technology like an electron microscope, which has been democratized, something which costs tens of thousands of dollars for $1,200. And I've got that device, this device right here. It's actually a molecular spectroscope, uh, which at your, on your palm can measure, uh, you know, body fat, look at, uh, you know, how fresh a food is, for example. So I'm holding it right here. In fact, I happen to have an apple also with me. Uh, maybe it's not so visible on my screen. Maybe now it is, yeah. So I can actually scan the apple and it will give me how fresh that is in terms of carbohydrate, fat content, and so forth. I actually connect it through my phone so I can even do a live demo as we're talking about. So I'll show you that you can probably see, uh, it's hard to see on that. Uh, screen there, maybe if I just change to, oh no. I think it's a little bit hard to see on, on sorry, on with this virtual we, display on. We'll have to trust you. <laughs> yeah, right. But you can see on the, on the screen there, um, you know, that you can get a spectral fingerprint pretty much of your uh, piece of fru fruit or food, which could be cheese, for example, in this case, looking at calories, protein levels, carbs, and so forth. And, you can even recognize pills with that. So, you know, some, this is an amazing sort of progress in technology where we've seen things move so fast and democratized so quickly. And similarly, we're seeing that with the wrist one wearables, you know, right? I'm sure many of you have been wearing Fitbits and Apple Watches and, and other, uh, you know, wrist one wearables, but I think it's much how they've evolved. And I've got something here called the Life Band, which measures whole heart health. Uh, you know, and that sort of gives me something which the medical center, which also I'm holding right here, and you can see in the in the picture there, uh, you know, it does body fat, body temperature, oxygen saturation, heart rate variability, and, uh, and uh, you know, so many other different, and blood pressure all on your, you know, palm of your hand. And this one does it on the wrist. So I can do blood pressure. I can even look at my heart age, my mood through the heart rate variability that it measures. So... A lot of the technology with medical grade and clinical grade sort of capability is already out there, um, which we can utilize. And now we're, what we're noticing is in the media space, you know, we've evolved so rapidly from what was called the media 1.0, which is a lean back, sit back, relax, couch potato mode or watching TV, for example, to a media 2.0, which is uh, a more engaged, you know, like a computer interactive mode to a media 3.0, which is jump in immersive media um, into you know, really looking at um, how do we, uh, with augmented and virtual reality, something which first came about from Project Natal or from the Kinect, from Nintendo V, for example, um, you know, all that has evolved. And there's an interesting startup that I was involved with called The Ring, which was about the natural user interface. And again, I've got a quick video of that, which I'll play. which will allow you to control almost anything. You just need to wear the ring and tap on the side to start your gesture. Ring captures and analyzes your gesture inside of it and sends the data to your smart devices. Vibration and LED notifies you of status updates. And no I'll just pause there, yep. So yeah, as you okay. see, turn down the volume here. Um, yeah, the, it's the, really the natural user interface, you know, looking at you know, normal gestures that can enable you to turn on volume, turn off lights, and do so many different um, interactions in a more, a lot more harmonious matter where it's an evolution from the GUI to the NUI, as I call it. Um, and then what we're really seeing is this space of mixed reality, which is that 
moving from you know augmented and virtual reality and sort of transposing and juxtaposing both of those spaces into what we call the virtu virtuality continuum and uh, i think there's so many different areas there that we're seeing being influenced by augmented and virtual reality because it's really involved me and i learn and the interactive elements and the deep empathy that it sort of creates one of the startups i was mentoring a few years ago we were looking at actually um, uh, we're making a, a documentary a film rather on um, the deep empathy deficit in this on this planet in fact we had obama we had his holiness the Lai lama also on board but unfortunately we couldn't raise enough funds but that transformed and morphed into a virtual reality project later on by the startup and uh, you know looking at empathy from that uh, great technology sort of media became quite interesting. One of the st another startup that I've been mentoring called Relax VR, where we've used virtual reality for, you know, meditation, mindfulness, and putting people through a great multimedia with great music, a voiceover meditation, and uh, lovely, nice backgrounds. So, you know, there are now many different tools out there like Trip and obviously Headspace and Calm and others which are in this space. But um, we're seeing a, a massive rise in integration of these to the next level with a lot more new sensors coming about. Another great tool we're seeing in this mixed reality space, in, you know, is really Microsoft HoloLens. There have been others like, of course, Magic Leap and others, but I will not uh, have enough time to go through all of them. But we've seen um, early versions of this through Meta Space Classes it was another very pioneering one, which in fact had some Aussie startup uh, founders in there. Uh, so Microsoft HoloLens has been a great tool for, uh, you know, applying and uh, simulating different, um, you know, facets or even for digital twin based things for smart cities. So being able to provide a, a full interface. I've got a quick, uh, again, a bit of a video is playing back in the background there. I think it's very evident, obviously, the, the how powerful a medium like this can be in terms of, um, you know, bringing about a, a tool for training and, you know, simulating real life environments, you know, in a more safe manner and making it very interactive, obviously. Some medical examples and, of course, you know, in smart cities, there have been so many different um, applications there with buildings and right through to in the transportation space, I must say, uh, Microsoft has done a great, uh, you know, application with Qantas, one of our key carriers here in Australia, in that space, for uh, pilot training and for maintenance and so forth. Um, so what we were when we were talking about big data earlier, and I talked about experiation, and I think this is where another great uh, area that we're seeing is with mixed reality and more specifically in virtual reality, we're able to look at big data in a in a very deeply visual manner and look at in this medium of spatial sort of, uh, you know, understanding of what that data really means and insights sort of come right to you. And uh, one of those things we saw was with this uh, early tinkering that I was involved with the company called Impact Multimedia, where we tried with the very first Oculus uh, quite a few years back now, where we experienced pretty much on interest rates of banks. But then we could clearly see the uh, elements of what's coming about from those banks the, the right um, reasons of insights for those interest rates, taking those dips or in troughs and peaks. 
the reason that became very evident. Um, I'll just play that video quickly. Sorry, yeah, we've got this startup in, um, you know, a singularity you start up from um, Silicon Valley called uh, Flow, which is doing some amazing work. In fact, they've actually done COVID-19, uh, you know, visualizations and, and look at key trends in with heat maps and, and uh, 3D graphics and so forth. And being able to view that in, in a virtual reality mode has enabled a very powerful sort of uh, element there. Um, taking that to the next level, we're seeing things like holography and holograms are where you know we're pretty much doing a 360 with storytelling and uh, you know where we're really seeing that higher psychological spatial connection uh, you know come about we've evolved very much from the old campfires theaters television cinema um, you know mobile phones youtube pretty much and then moving on to mobile holograms which is coming back to that real deeply immersive sort of uh, a connection that uh, this form of storytelling is is evolving to us and uh, things like ARHD media and we even had uh, professor you know Stephen Hawking um, here in uh, the opera house about five years ago now um, and I was very much there watching him in a, in a hologram so it's going to be very much about less things and more people and that's where we talk about this real human centric elements coming about with um, you know, holography, and I think as we see Zoom evolve more into, we've been playing with a lot of different tools like Engage VR, Spatial, and um, you know, All Space VR, and many other tools in virtual reality where we can take them to the next level of interaction uh, and do events in that sort of mode. And uh, we're seeing that happen very much with this, um, you know, space evolved to holography. So the next part I wanted to mention was on mind senses on the brain computer interface, which is EEG and electroencephalography. And there have been some great, you know, work happening in that by companies like Neurosky, Mindplay, and applications across the board, where EEG has really been democratized with a single channel EEG sensor and applications in, uh, you know, what we're really seeing is, I'm showing you here is actually a quick uh, snapshot of uh, a, a visualization of your brain waves, your alpha, beta, delta, gamma brain waves and looking at it matched up being your attention or focus or your meditation or relaxation. And if we can get both of them together, we actually can get into the zone uh, much faster or in the flow state. And that's something uh, you know, we've been experimenting quite a bit with and looking at different tools. And you know, here's an example of a... mind control toy which uh, was launched by Neurosky a while ago. And, but we've got examples in um, you know, uh, controlling other objects in wellness, in education. Um, there are endless number of applications. Now we, one application is very much in measuring sleep. So I'm sure you've heard of sleep being measured through variables in different formats, but the brain wave sensor is probably the most accurate means there to measure your, and uh, this one called Sleep Shepherd, which actually gives you a sleep score and wakes you up to your natural body clock with, um, uh, you know, is a great variable there, which you can have as a textile based, uh, you wear at night and it's got, uh, you know, uh, speakers in the fabric, which can enable you to, uh, you know, wake up to the nice, uh, you know, uh, music and so forth. And pretty much binary beats that wake you up to the natural body clock rather than the um, chronological clock. Another great one is called Life. So this is a, a multi-channel EEG sensor, which will, um, you know, is great for measuring driver fatigue. So a lot of enterprises and say truckies are employed in the transportation space. You can take your truck off the road or your person remotely and see if they're really fatigued and stressed and, and uh, tired, then, um, you know, it's better than not be driving. So. Then there are other great tools looking at facial expression and emotional recognition and so forth, like Emotive, which has some great tools there. The Muse is a great mindfulness 
EEG, uh, you know, thing, and they've got the Muse S Pen, which I'm holding right here. And uh, this is a, a, you know, a five channel EEG sensor, which is in fabric and a great tool there with, you know, many different, um, you know, applications around uh, versions of mindfulness and, and relaxation that will enable you to take you to, through a whole new level of mental well-being. So it's really about tapping that innovation state. And that's something I was quite involved with looking at how do we use brain waves and the brain computer interface to deploy in an innovation lab that we'd set up called iZone. And uh, we looked at really key elements of alpha where you we can look at creativity a lot, lot more in the relaxed state. And uh, you know this was iZone that we had as a tinkering early imagination lab that was set up in India. And uh, it was interesting to sort of look at how can you influence uh, the right you know, creativity with measuring the, those brain waves and taking people through the right journey and, uh, and uh, making them more effective in that sort of brainstorming, for example. Another great uh, example of uh, application of this is in education and learning, which is Effective Learner, which is by NeuroSky is a great tool for looking at uh, you know, brain wave sensors, um, for looking at attention spans of students and then using Pomodoro method, for example, of you know, making sure that they've retained what they've learned nicely uh, and, uh, you know, taking that further. So it's it's something which has been, um, you know, very proven in certain tests that, that have been performed in Finland, for example, in schools, where they give the right amount of rest and then come back into a time-boxed based learning paradigm. So the next space is really where we've got the two-way, uh, you know, brain-computer interface what the BMI or the brain machine interface. And I, if you if you mentioned that earlier with the, um, uh, you know, graph from Gartner hype cycle earlier, and there's something called transcranial brain stimulation, where there've been so many, you know, great startup that I was mentoring in the space called Lumbre, where we've been working with the cerebral palsy sort of space and looking at uh, disability tech and uh, really looking at how can you influence and bring back the motor skills of uh, you know people who are differently abled, for example, and uh, great applications of that in uh, really building that mind of the future. And what we're really seeing is um, you know this influence with um, developments like Neuralink from uh, you know which Elon Musk has more recently uh, provided with three pigs as an experiment that they showcased about a month ago now in their evolution of how we're talking about using you know less evasive sort of means to have a very precise brain computer interface a, a bi -direct directional one to um, you know actually reduce um, and improve uh, creativity and, and look at so many other areas so we see that um, you know technology is moving so fast that it's pretty much indistinguishable from magic in many regards and uh, one of the examples of that tdcs or transcranial direct current stimulation is this thing called halo by Halo 2, by New Halo Neuroscience. I'm holding it right here, actually. So that sits on my head, and uh, we've got kind of uh, you know low current electrodes on the top, which will enable a low current through your brain uh, for you to be able to perform certain sports faster, to stimulate your new, your motor cortex, for example, and uh, even inc improve creativity to an extent. So I can tell you that there's some tools already out there, which are you know, early stage, but they're very um, interesting to to see the impact of. Another great variable that I've been uh, involved with is actually called heart math. And, uh, you know, imagine basically if you were able to, um, if you could activate a heart intelligence by hacking our consciousness. And that's pretty much what heart math uh, in a balance allows you to do. So uh, what it's really measuring is and helping you with is your subconscious mind and your power of improving your power of intuition. And, you know, we are all connected with the Earth's uh, energetic fields. The resonant frequency of the Earth's magnetic field is the same as the human heart rhythm uh, when we are in a coherent state. So helping you with your brain heart coherence is what, um, you know, heart math is allowing you to do here and reducing stress, finding balance. And uh, this device again is, is, is a great, I'm in fact holding it right here. It's a very small device that clips to my ear, and uh, uh, it's it's something which you know is really just play a quick little. Can you video. hear me? 
Can you feel me? This is a story about your life and about new ways to see that we are all connected. Just like electricity changed the outer world, we're always associated with the heart, really do um, affect the way the heart beats and the quality of the neural signal. So, you know how um, sort of people talk about uh, connecting, well, in the uh, industry space or B2B or B2C, I've been talking about H to H or connecting human to human or heart to heart. And I think that's really where the next phase of our connectivity is uh, you know, evolving in, in humanity for humanity. So uh, it was interesting, you know, when I had, uh, was very fortunate to have some interaction with Steve Jobs a long time back and the discussion I had with him about his trip to India, where he and his friend Kotke had traveled uh, to the Himalayas and uh, to kind of almost in search of enlightenment. And uh, in 1970, April 1974, when he traveled there, and uh, you know, a great book that he found was Autobiography of a Yogi by Swami Paramahansa Yogananda. And it was really about his great saying, having the courage to follow your heart and intuition, because they really truly know what uh, you know what will become of you and i think uh, it's a great book that he in fact read every single year he had on his ipad and uh, great inspiration from i think learnings that even many people allude to apple being formed once he got back and when he joined atari and sort of uh, after that you know came up with uh, conceptualizing apple and it's this whole space of well, technology and spirituality sort of coming together, which was has been a part of my own journey for the last decade and a half, where I've been working on many different concepts and ideas, looking at this mood boards from body, mind, and soul, and uh, technology being influenced by, uh, you know, nature and many other facets there, and looking at the this key trend of balance, and looking at you know how we'd been kind of pretty much out of sync with 24/7 lifestyles that we've been living and the stress levels being rising with burnouts, depressions, and, and all that, you know, becoming uh, an increasing concern, even much more than the pandemic itself, as we know. And it's about taking all our senses to the next dimension. So I've been looking at concepts where we look at all five of our senses, but how do we uplift them and elevate it to the next level? And one of the concepts that we came up with, in fact, my team and myself uh, in Siemens, this is 15 years ago now, uh, we looked at this space of uh, a concept called Zen, pretty much around music, where we looked at um, how can it be used as a prime means of relaxation. So imagine you're in the concrete jungle, how can you cocoon yourself and become and be part of this, uh, you know, have the right sort of yin and yang influence, but looking at, um, you know, haptic ball interface. And we came up with the concept, which was looking like this at that time, and with noise cancellation headphones, and taking you through a, the right content into a mode called, uh, called the kind of the bliss mode, pretty much. And it was about the core facets of the body, mind, and the soul, looking at the design experience, the user experience, and then the brand experience and product feeling, uh, all integrated to harmonize in that regard. And then this was the concept that I actually worked much further on and then even presented as my own MTP or Passively Transforming Purpose to His Holiness Dalai Lama. And it was about, uh, I'll just read that out. Imagining a world where we've created a breakthrough phenomena of a mobile device or an ecosystem or architecture being used to help heal people from their suffering, bring a better work-life balance, help one relax and humanity rediscover their true essence. So it's um, uh, you know something which uh, caught quite some eyes and I think it's where White Mirror has sort of manifested in some form through that. And I very much talk about it in how do we you know, look at our own within ourselves to find true happiness because it's difficult to find it anywhere else. And I think as you've all seen with the COVID, if you can't go outside, it's about going inside. And that's where I think great tools like the Muse and so forth have been a great facet of help. So uh, this whole um, term of uh, bringing in super longevity, intelligence and well-being is bringing together this movement of transhumanism, as we call it. And I think that's where we see that whole movement in new skills come about, um, which are coming about in this space of, uh, you know, moving into the fourth and the, and the fifth industrial revolution, which is under the making. Um, we've seen things evolve very moving up the ladder, like uh, critical thinking, creativity, and so forth. 
uh, you know, which were not so high up on the list earlier by the World Economic Forum. And something which NeuroSky has in fact also got is how do we measure uh, peak performance, uh, you know, or looking at those quantifying those 21st century skills like creativity, empathy, engagement, but also look at other states of happiness and so forth, which we can integrate and, and map, uh, you know, using the brain computer interface again to, uh, you know, really get a, a much better understanding on how can we improve them. And I think it's, that's where we, there's a great book actually by Bruce Nussbaum, who talks about, uh, and something which I've then evolved further into from old to new dogmas from, it's no longer about user engage experience, it's about user engagement. It's from a tech driven to an engagement driven economy, from consumer to community, needs to wants, empathy to meaning, story to narrative, from just simple brainstorming to connecting the dots. And I think those are key facets of that consciousness that we need to exhibit in a smart city. And as we evolve from the physical, uh, you know, intelligence, emotional, spiritual, and something that, which is most important now is the adaptability quotient, the AQ, or the having that AI capability with relevance for today. And then I think you, if some of you might have heard of this term called Ikigai, which is really your massively transforming purpose to a regard. It's a great Japanese philosophy of your reason, reason for being, what you love to do, what the world needs, what you get paid for, and what you're good at. When all of that intersect, it's really something which um, you know, formulates your Ikigai or your reason for being in that regard. And what I could recommend is also um, you know, very much a couple of great uh, tools there, or I'm sure you've heard of The Secret, which has been around for a while. It's been a movie and also a, uh, well, a rather a documentary and a great book. And a more recent book that a friend of mine wrote uh, that I was fortunate to review was called The Serendipity Mindset. And I think that's where we very much talk about, um, you know, how do we build that muscle of the law of attraction truly and intuition and all guiding you. So it's a shift as we move from the old VUCA to the new VUCA, which is vision, understanding, clarity, and agility is what's needed now. So I'm coming towards the end of my presentation now, because I know I've taken a lot of time and <laughs> been talking quite a bit. Um, the future really needs to be shaped and not predicted because the world is moving so fast that, that there are days when a person who says it can't be done is interrupted by a person who's already doing it. A great community for conscious leadership that I was involved with, uh, uh, you know, that was uh, launched at the World Economic Forum this year uh, is called uh, Wisdom Health. And we talk about regenerative humanity, uh, bringing back ancient wisdom, resilience, and really humane economy and technology driven elements. Uh, you know, I think it's a great learnings on that and how conscious leadership has evolved to, uh, you know, evolve into that, that whole facet of the new world order. Because the most exciting breakthroughs of the 21st century will not occur because of technology but because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human, says John Nasbitt. So I think coming back to the SDGs, that's where we really need to focus. And that's where I'm you know, putting energies with our white mirror sort of team and work and how do we map them and how can we influence and really create that right action. And the fourth term that I've been sort of looking at coining is cohortability, which is uh, coherence, adaptability, all coming together with, you know, coming from the heart and the human uh, element of consciousness. So my final couple of slides now on takeaways. So it's about adapting your exponential mindset, bringing collaboration, embracing a level of white mirror type philosophy, you know, having deep curiosity, empathy, and uh, applying Jugard and frugal thinking. Again, that's a whole massive topic in itself. We could talk about that quite a bit. Um, the great book I, could, I was showing earlier about Jugard there, applying simplexity, um, you know, embracing exponential technologies, you know, deploying rapid experimentation of learning as I call it, which is learnings from failure and uh, exploiting experiation to take storytelling to a new level incorporating transdisciplinarity, multiple industries, cross industry, um, you know, cross uh, uh, disciplines. It's very important that we can actually bring together and be that generalist to quite an extent, but also go deeper into certain topics that we need to. Unlearning, displacing it for more meaningful, building our foresight muscle, and then really taking that journey within of, you know, 
uh, appropriately applying all those different tools of mindfulness and so forth. And really, at the end, it's all about imagination and applying that because it's a lot more important than knowledge, as says Albert. Uh, knowledge is limited, imagination encircles the world. And uh, finally, happiness is the new rich, inner peace is the new success, health is the new wealth, kindness is the new cool. And those are some of the mantras, and this was a great circulation that came about on uh, during the early part of COVID, which I've been spreading. And I'd like to end by quoting the Mahatma, that true collaboration only happens when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. So yeah, I'll just end right here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anuraj. And there have been a few thanks as a few people have had to move on. It's the way the month is going. People pop in when they can. Uh, sure. But there's been a robust chat going on on the side. I think some of the local questions. Uh, but we will now have the last uh, half hour for those of us who are still able to be here uh, to just raise questions or comments and engage with Anuraj. Uh, if you're like me, because I love tech, but I'm also, I think, like some people are saying in the chat, not a big tech push person. So one of the things, uh, one thing when you see all of these things are what does it mean <laughs> for what you're actually trying to do? So I'm sure a number of you have been provoked uh, 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 or perhaps you have questions about how this relates at all to the work you do. So I'd just like to open up the space. Uh, there's a raise hand feature that Zoom has. Feel free to pop up your hand if you'd like to make a comment, ask a question. Uh, I think what is important, and I mentioned to Anuraj that it was likely to come up, is uh, how we in our context uh, 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 connect or struggle to connect, I suppose, some of the interesting examples of tech, but also some of the messages that Anuraj is, is giving us about how he thinks about these things that can be quite difficult to reconcile. Uh, I think all of us uh, uh, may have questions in our minds. So let me just open up the space for any hand raising while Anuraj can grab a glass of water. Um, there are, let's just see if there are any that we should start with in the chat while I wait to see if any hands pop up. Um, a number of the comments, I mean, there were some comments about, you know, in, in a way a concern about the role of governments uh, uh, in all of this, you know, how can governments enable this kind of work? And maybe I can try to reframe that to you, perhaps from similar contexts where you've already mentioned being engaged, Anuraj. So for example, you've mentioned doing quite a bit of work in India. Uh, yep. which in some ways perhaps uh, 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 shares some similarities to our kind of context here. Uh, what, what, what in your view has been an enabling or disabling role of governments in enabling um, the kinds of technologies that you think are more empathetic and are more meaningful for, for, for what you'd like to see in your white mirror world? Sure. So I think just relating to smart cities and, and so forth and, and sort of future city uh, developments, uh, India is actually witnessing a massive growth, obviously, as people may know, with, in terms of its economy, and it has been, uh, well, pre-COVID, and even now it's just slowed down, unfortunately, for a shorter time. But um, India has got 100 new smart cities coming up just in a matter of next more uh, five to seven more years, 36 or so of them are already almost ready to a certain level. Again, it's really about definition of smart cities as we talk about in there. But we've seen India go through quite some transformation, you know, and there's learnings from um, you know, experiments that the government has been doing with uh, public-private partnerships, but also then the evolution and really the, I think the leadership they took to an extent, which has been a great one in each e-citizenship sort of capabilities and making that online and digitizing a lot of that because there was so much paperwork and old school uh, thinking as, as you can well imagine. And I'm sure Africa and other countries emerging, all the BRICA countries have been going through that same phase of evolution, which the West had been going through early on. And many countries like that still are doing a lot of physical paperwork based stuff. But I think India leapfrogged in so many revolutions, especially the mobile revolution. So, you know, with landline phones, which were, uh, you know, displaced by mobile so quickly, you know, the growth of mobile has been so phenomenal. And then the low cost smartphones and that proliferation of entry level devices, which have been in um, a very affordable and accessible by the layman has and making very simple apps. Uh, which have, again, the government has played a key role in, you know, in terms of providing those citizenship services of filling forms, uh, getting your normal rations and, and uh, you know, having your identity, for example. So I think the UID project in India has been a great uh, example of a, of a great successful, it's been the biggest IT project in the world. So it's called the Unique Identity, 
and and that's where everybody has what is now called the Aadhaar card or a unique number. And so many people were not identified. You know, they didn't have their identification documents, but now they've actually been biometric. Each of the fingerprints have been. We've got a, a biometric scan of that and the iris scan and so forth. And uh, you know, I think it's uh, the numbers are just phenomenal. It's close to a billion people out of the 1.3 odd billion people in India. Uh, almost a billion people have already got a UID and the Aadhaar card out there, which is phenomenal. I think you're you're, you're muted. You're muted, Kishi. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, so maybe let's use that one to touch on another thing people were kind of raising in the chat, I guess is, uh, and it's similar to, you know, the big uh, China, you're talking about the UID now in India. So, so the trust issue, right? So, uh, and, and we kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, that on the one hand, one can see the bigger efficiencies that come out of big data used to help with administration and governance. But on the mm. other hand, there's the concern about what that means, uh, yes, for privacy, but also for, you know, the commercialization. I think Anand made a comment that the, the, the democratized is a loaded term. Often the cheaper tech is simply commoditized. Um, mm. And so this is, it's not just the idea that some, you know, you know, this idea that somehow we're all being turned into parts of a big corporate <laughs> exercise. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that? And were those issues that came up in India? So was the UID, were there concerns uh, from the citizenry around this sort of identification of people, even though it might assist with delivering services? Yeah, of course. I mean, there's always, uh, uh, you know, both sides of the coin, right? <laughs> and I think it's about weighing, uh, okay, what is more advantages and what is bringing more benefit for society? And and I think that's where we, we noticed that, um, uh, you know, things like what, the government has been sort of trying to proliferate through these new e-services and M services and so forth, is that they obviously it's privacy to a certain extent does open up the topic, you know, it, it could it very much does open up, but I think it's, it's about providing, bringing better law and order, bringing in better services and more personalization for people. So again, as long as it's done in the right manner and that, you know, it's secure, well, security is, of course, uh, uh, again, in quoted, you know, it's, it's, it's cybersecurity is such a big topic there. Um, I won't go there. I'm not an expert at all in that, any of those spaces. But um, I think, yeah, it's, it's all about how do you opt in in a smart way, create that smart, capable way of having the users being in control of their information because their own data is, their, is the currency, is their own, uh, is something of great value. So it's how much you share. But again, as I said, on one parallel, people share so much on social media so loosely, whereas they are so scared of sharing other valuable things. And that's why we've seen, even in the West, we've seen a very slow pickup of medical records, for example, you know, online medical records. And this, this whole movement has been going on for, for so long. I mean, I've still seen uh, hospitals and doctors and everybody still using fax machines from 20, 30 years ago right now for <laughs> communicating, right? <laughs> and... Uh, you know things like that, but I think it's it's slowly going away, or rapidly going away now, <laughs> because um, you know we're overcoming those fears now. I think to an extent, but yeah, it's it's really something which needs to be a lot more transparent in how your data is being used, and those are the wake ups that we're seeing from companies like the big giants of Google's and Facebooks and so forth of the world are waking up to. Well, and in a way, that's a point I can see here in the chat. It's a point that uh, Stephanie is just warning about that if we have to keep mindful about who's actually driving these agendas uh, and if they are driven by big companies, a lot of the innovations you've, you've, you've shown us, and then I guess maybe it makes sense that the tech that tends to make it to those stages, even if it's startup, would have to be capitalized in some sort of way. And I guess that's why where there's more money, there's more things that, that, that make it to the real world. You know, is, is, is that something that needs to shift in your view or can we still somehow have this kind of conscious uh, tech evolution you're talking about when it's in fact driven by big corporates. Yeah, but I think that's where their mindset shift I was saying, you know, of uh, the PPP or or having or being like a B, B Corp and, and really thinking planet and purpose and people um, much before profit. So if every organization has that as the key mantra and the underlying foundation of how they're actually going to serve humanity and, and bring about that and, and collaborate and cooperate with the rest of uh, society for the betterment of and uplifting society as a whole. Uh, I think big broad terms or, or, or vision there, but 
it can be done. And I think that's where startups are actually playing, are taking great charge, obviously. They are so many, uh, and I think startups are uh, in, in general, you know, or in many cases, the B Corp driven ones, social uh, you know, entrepreneurship uh, sort of movement is enabling that to a very much uh, higher extent. So that's what we need to bring about in the corporate world and the enterprise and the space where they just so been driven by boardrooms and profits and, and all, and that wake up's been happening fairly quickly now, I would say, you know, they've all been doing great things with, um, you know, uh, charity and other social causes on the side, but it has to be mainstream. It has to be just part of the whole underlying ethos of the organization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, th- I think I appreciate that point. And, and I guess with the startup ecosystems, why that's important as well is, um, you know, we talk about de- democratizing of the tech, but of course, democratizing of the innovation space itself, uh, being more mm-hmm. inclusive and allowing more to happen. So Brian agrees with you on the privacy point. I think he's saying that privacy is something people already give up so much that, that, that it needs to be leveraged so that voices yep. can be heard. So I, I think Brian's agreeing with you. Rian asks a question here. He says, what would you consider to be the infrastructural building blocks or catalysts uh, towards stimulating the development of smart communities or smart cities uh, and associated technologies in a country like South Africa, especially with our sort of big rural areas? So what would be the infrastructural building blocks or catalysts to stimulate relevant innovation for us? Right. Again, I would, draw, I would draw that parallel or that uh, learnings from like what's been in India has done with e-governance and and governance and, and those sort of apps, citizenship apps and so forth, citizen apps rather, um, which uh, I think have been a great framework to connect all those dots, you know, of people applying for licenses, for filling their forms. Um, and that's where I think the rural uh, parts of the market in India earlier were very disconnected. And I think you can see a similar thing, that disconnect between urban and rural, uh, you know, people who really have that digital divide to quite an extent. How do we bridge that, you know? And how do we bridge that socioeconomic divide to a, to the next level on that regard? And it's all interlinked, I would say. So it's about bringing and mass uh, education of and the simplicity of uh, proliferating these simple to use apps, which everybody in every you know low cost smartphone can also deploy, you know, and and people can use at at different levels of literacy even. So how do you uh, make that mainstream and how do you reach out to those people and handhold them at many cases? Because there are, you know, even in the Western market, we have elderly people who haven't used computers, you know, and they need, uh, we've had mobile phones and I've been involved very much in designing phones from so many different angles for elderly people for aged care and looking at phones with big buttons, phones with bigger screens and the UI, the whole customization. And I think similarly, we need to be able to be very inclusive for people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And, uh, and that's where we, we need to make it so universal. And the government is certainly, I think, playing a very key role in that. And I think this is where we've seen, I've been involved with a lot of disability tech with uh, accelerators like Remarkable and others where we talk about inclusivity. And I mean, we're talking about one in um, you know, 10 people on this planet are disabled if, in some regard or the other, even mental disability is huge. So it's how do you make something more accessible is is the key there i think great thank you katarina your hand is up your screen is on welcome just unmute yeah it'd be good to see some people if anybody can yeah hello katarina and katarina's done some great work she's actually written a white mirror um you know next version of the article with smart cities in fact i just sent that to you geshe earlier so she's the one and uh, part of wisdom health community and we've been uh, you know great that She's proliferating some amazing ideas there. I think, I thank you very much Hello, for Katrina. the opportunity to enter in the conversation. And yeah. uh, I, I really love the, the talk, Anuraj, because you really made this overview of the WASP technologies. And these technologies are no anymore in the lab. They are already on the market. They are available, they are cheap. And I think we are in times that we need uh, public space for public debates about moral values and responsibility on a personal level, in a sense that uh, education to the young generation that will use these technologies and that are living already in the West, I, I, I suppose it's quite nowadays equally around the world, 
the young generation, children up to 10, 15 are totally immersed in the virtual world. And mm. we as parents, we are not educating because we are totally don't, don't understand the virtual world already. And there mm. is a huge responsibility and a huge threat of our moral, how you are living and using and uh, what is the, the values. We speak about inclusiveness and no, no, not anti-racism, no discrimination. And this is for our generation. The generation of my kids, they are totally inclusive. They're speaking with uh, square heads and uh, ugly, ugly faces as avatars. They really mm. cannot understand the fighting between gender, between races and other countries. They are totally connected. I mean, it's, they cannot feel the space, for example, or the time. Uh, and I believe we need as uh, adults to, to have more conversation with the young generations that are living mm. in these virtual spaces and get more knowledge from them and more user experience exactly how they perceive the world, what is a, a real for them. Because I believe for this generation, there is a huge, um, uh, there is no a frontier between physical and virtual world. For them, the screen, it's another door and their experience are totally realistic. So when we see all these devices about our body, I, I always think about how lazy we can become if we are not educating in responsibility. If we just uh, use these devices and we think that we are meditating, how connected we can be in our bodies because we trust the, the device to measure us. I, I yeah. think we need this, to have these discussions uh, to be a, a really wake up because technology is so easy to use that mm -hmm. we really can become lazy. And then uh, we can be really become manipulated by, by policies, by uh, corporate uh, interests. If we don't have these discussions, it's not about, to me, it's not about black, negative and positive. It's about the balance between two, to understand in a, in a bigger picture, the ecosystem, the relationships, and see how some negative points of the technology can be positive points to me to motivate me to train more, to, to go to deeper understanding of the technology, how it's doing, not just to trust it, use it and become lazy. It, to me, my, how to say, my hope for the future is that this uh, easiness of the technology make us more curious to go deeper and to challenge our limits as a people, as a person, to be really aware where the reality is real and where it come fantasies. I mean, in the past, uh, there was this uh, uh, Dao, Dao word, uh, I'm the butterfly that is dreaming a human, or I am a human that is dreaming to be a butterfly. And mm -hmm. today, to me, this become a reality, because in the, with the virtual reality glasses, you can mm -hmm. become a butterfly. So how yeah. much we can distinguish and how much we need to redefine what we call the reality. And I will really, I believe for the audience, it will be very interesting to see your points over this need for responsibility, for conversation between us and really take all the, the points around the technologies. No, I, t I totally agree with you. And in fact, my own journey, uh, I think we get carried away so quickly with technology. And you're right with the youngsters and the, the people, young people are, for them, the digital, you know, revolution is a given and social media is just a, their foundation, you know, they've grown up with. But I think it's, it's, it's a real wake up that is happening. And I think that's why things like the social dilemma, which is, is waking us all up to a level and saying, we need to take our digital detoxes. And it's something which I realized in my own career. I was so engrossed with designing mobile phones, using them applying and as you saw with many examples I've been giving, but at the same time, my awakening was about how do I flip that? It's not about turning off my phone. It's about flipping it into what I call the bliss mode and enabling that uh, reduced screen time to a, to a level where I'm immersing and it's helping me to go back into myself for mindfulness. And those that's where these tools, some of the sensors and the tools that come in to help quantify and then to help me become better in that mindfulness exercise, for example. And I think, yeah, it's really about what we're seeing is uh, technology is also causing more inequalities in that level, you know. And I think we're seeing it's unfortunate that 
you know, if people who get carried away are so dwelled into it that it's become an addiction much more than that. And, uh, and we need to help people wake up to that new and, and take the right detoxes at the right time to find that balance. You're right. It's not about a black or white. And that's why white mirror is not about saying you flip it to a totally positive manner. It's about finding the balance and equilibrium of every level of uh, your balance of, of life in general. Yeah. I really appreciate that you're raising that and Katrina made this point because I do think that, well, as the mother of teenagers, uh, I have a very real concern <laughs> about them. Um, but in a way, it mirrors, I suppose, uh, how all of us see these things that, and, and you know, it, we're in a, in a context that's a deeply unequal uh, country uh, and where development issues are real. And sometimes I'm sure for many people, perhaps even people on this call, it gets a little mm -hmm. bit irritating when people want to talk about technology, when people are still struggling with food and sanitation. I think a few people have made these points on there. And so you feel like you almost have to either be a person who's into tech or a person who's against tech because you're doing serious things. You know, so it becomes this kind of really strange thing. And I often find myself, even within myself perhaps, uh, wondering, you know, how does one maintain that balance because I think also sticking our heads into a hole around te about technology that actually is happening around us is also probably not you know, the, the, the solution. Uh, believing tech is only good is not particularly helpful and, 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 and I think you're both saying as much. Uh, believing it's all terrible is also, is, is also not, not really great. So I, I guess that question of how we sustain that consciousness and how institutions are also encouraged to play a role in that, I think becomes mm. quite tricky. Uh, and I'm sure it's tricky for organizations to figure out as well, you know, for governments and for that, you know, you either have to be, uh, in South Africa, there's been a very big um, drive around the fourth industrial revolution. And I think people are a little bit, I think, sick of it sometimes, you know, hearing <laughs> about, you know, how technology is changing everything when people are still struggling with very basic things. Uh, uh, and, and so I don't know if you feel, um, from an institutional perspective, since a few people raised this in the chat, you know, what is it the government needs to do or what is it that whoever needs to do? You know, are there any examples, uh, any positive examples perhaps you see about, I know you've mentioned in terms of leadership, so the leadership itself being uh, uh, perhaps visionary, but yeah. do you see other examples of how we can be encouraged to find and sustain this kind of a balance uh, as, as, as societies perhaps through institutions or is it, does it all come from the individual? So maybe I'll just touch on one point earlier, which is, you know, I, I think rightly, we, we have to talk the right language, the same language rather, like for teenagers, right? And you've got three teenage, teenagers there. And, you know, it's, we have to talk their language and we have to use technology in the right level to get to communicate with them. And I think that's where we've seen great tools. Obviously, um, uh, teenagers are the, have been screenagers. So we have to use some sort of a screen. And then I think I'd, I'd maybe invite even Brian to make some comments because my colleague there, he's been part of our White Mirror team and he's done an amazing amount of work there. He's based in Oakland up in um, San Francisco. And, uh, you know, he built this Unity Sanctuary, which is a great spiritual upliftment journey in virtual reality. Again, through technology, he's proliferated in Burning Man and created such an uplifting experience, which is able to, and I think that's what I was talking about, this bliss mode and, and being able to use the right means of technology to take people through a journey and, and bring them out in a very positive manner and, uh, and, and really use that in a, in a very harmonious sort of means. So I think that's one great example. Maybe Brian might want to say some more comments. I know he's been, I can see great comments he's been making already in chat. But, uh, yes, yes, he's, oh, he's informed us, uh, and I don't know if he's willing to chat now, he just informed us that he's being very careful about uh, a sleeping wife, uh, and so he was worried about uh, waking yeah, her up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey everybody, it's, it's Brian, can you hear me? Oh, there's Brian, he's willing to speak. Oh, Sorry, yeah. I just Great. wanted to say hi everyone, you know, I'm trying to be quiet, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a New Yorker, so my voice is like, vibrates the apartment. <laughs> so she's sleeping, but you know, um, thank you for your beautiful introduction. Oh, no, um, I am almost humbled by what you said, uh, very much so. Uh, and I actually, you have the rainbow behind your head now. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's the white mirror, white rainbow mirror. As we talk oh, about it. <laughs> but, you know, um, uh, one of the reasons uh, the driving forces for the Unity Sanctuary is, you know, the design is uh, kind of uh, inspired by, you know, uh, aesthetic and design from different culture and religion uh, to sort of, uh, when people walk into the space, they feel maybe 
more open to the connection because maybe they recognize something they've learned uh, through their own cultural religion or something from someone else they know and modalities of sound and light healing that would happen in this space uh, would be from other cultures and religions uh, and sort of bringing together unity, which is why I call it Unity Sanctuary. And actually the altars will be having their design in different cultures and religion. Uh, and I feel like, you know, it's important to include everyone to show that we're all the same. And the technology is a very big part of it. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, it's easier sometimes to see the power behind you. Uh, uh, like for instance, if you take EEG, uh, and create a connection between something that's very large and you know like a lighting sequence in a big sculpture and you know a child can see how powerful they really are how powerful you know they are the the, the connection is coming from them uh, and using sort of technology you know uh, wrapped around uh, artistic wrapped around technology to sort of help people digest more a complicated scientific understanding to show, you know, it's not hard. These things are not hard. You know, everyone has a voice. Everyone has feelings and emotion. Um, uh, and us here in this room, uh, we understand maybe a little more of how to use technology to leverage that. So, you know, uh, the only reason I mentioned government is because government funds uh, with, to, the, to, the, to the military so much, uh, so much t innovation you know, through uh, big business. And, you know, I'd like to see more of that sort of, you know, spread out amongst what we have uh, for the general public, like release more information, help us more. Um, and um, that's really more of what I'm thinking. And I also mentioned something in the chat called Earthship. I don't know enough about it to explain it in better detail, but Earthship is a really interesting program that teaches people how to build their own sustainable house in a sustainable community. Uh, um, and uh, uh, it's an education program uh, that teaches people how to create their life and where they live mm, and energy. Wonderful. And it's something maybe, and if anyone wants, I've put the link in here, I'll put it again in a second. Here we go. I put it again in case it's got lost in the chat. Earthshift Global, if anyone wants to look into that, um, uh, a friend of mine introduced it to me. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just a, such a beautiful concept, you know, create this beautiful house you live in that's completely sustainable, solar power, using energy in really beautiful ways and teaching you how to do it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for letting me speak. I think that, that was, that's all I can well, say you, right now. You, Brian. That's um, Thanks, really Brian. wonderful, yeah. I think we need to protect our wonderful planet <laughs> with um, mm. the precious, uh, you know, gift we have of nature and, and the Gaia philosophy, as was I was mentioning earlier. And I think that's where the smart city consciousness has to be driven, you know, with harmonizing all these entities and, and say, okay, how do we, well, how are we living amongst billions of other organisms who've been in this ecosystem for so long, much longer than us itself, and been in such a, uh, you know, equilibrium state. So, yeah. And I think that's a great note to end on just as we come in here. And thanks as well, Brian, for the resources in the chat, because um, I suspect that part of the fear about technology um, or even the exaggerated hope in it sometimes must come from some kind of a disempowered, <laughs> a disempowered feeling people have about it, right? So these messages that talk about, you know, so consciousness is not just about being a conscious user of something that's happening to you. But being a conscious actor, I think, you know, uh, uh, being able to ask those questions, being able to think about what are our values, increasing our curiosity, like Katrina was saying, uh, deciding why and what you're using something for, like Brian is, is suggesting to us. Um, uh, and I think these are really important messages, Anuraj, that you leave us with. Um, uh, we're getting up close to time, so I can see people are beginning to head off to, to other things. It's late afternoon here in South Africa, so it's probably... We don't have much traffic anymore since COVID, but I, I suspect everybody has their <laughs> afternoon routines anyway. Um, but I just really, really like to thank all of you who are still here and Anuraj uh, for taking the time. I know it's the middle of the night, uh, as we can see in your background. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the middle right. of somewhere. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so, we, yes, yes. We really appreciate your, your being up this late. Uh, I, I think you probably... 
provoked a number of us. And I, like I said, in our context, I think many of us struggle to make sense of what all of this means uh, in our context. Uh, but I think we do have, and I see Patrick's just posted a comment here about tech that can be more empowering, that can make us more independent, self-reliant and sovereign, you know, as opposed to what many of us hear, which is this other side of tech, the idea that it's about us being surveilled or controlled by <laughs> big bad something else. So, 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 so thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm going to ask those of us who are still here, if you're willing to turn on your cameras for a brief moment, uh, my friend Melissa here, who's our tech host, is wanting to take a picture of all of you. She can take a picture of your names as well, but for those who are willing to turn on their camera for a moment, ah, there we see Brian, uh, please do that so that we can see you all and we can see each other and who's out there for a brief moment. Hi, Patrick, good to see you, Rian, Nati, Kumo. Look at all these beautiful faces, Mavato. Uh, good to see you. Uh, so just turn on your cameras if you can. Uh, as we're doing that, the next sessions we've got uh, in the series, the next one's going to be on imagination. And that, for those of you who are familiar with theory U uh, or also causal layered analysis, this idea that um, we get into a stage where we can think about changing the metaphor or the myth, uh, the image we have of the future and what's the role of representation in that. So we'll have an urban designer architect uh, doing, you know, sharing some of his experimenting and thinking in that space. Some of you might, you know, you know, like speculative architecture and some of the work people have done for many years in this kind of work. Uh, but quite, quite exciting that. The next one will be really much more about people, about participation and what does it mean to talk about uh, these things in a much more communal, inclusive way, especially in unequal contexts like ours. And then only in the last session do we get to talking about what we always talk about, which is what should somebody somewhere do about it. <laughs> um, and hopefully by the time we get to that, it might be following this sequence of conversations, a different quality of conversation than what we're all sick of. So, so let's see whether we succeed in the course of the month uh, to evolving into a different conversation. So I'm going to take this picture quickly, or if somebody hasn't already taken it, so say please. Uh, and that didn't happen. Let's try that again. Okay, we've got it now. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, and I'd just like to say thank you to you all. So go well. Uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, there are more events on the website. Check it out. There's like 80 events happening all month. It'll be great to see more of you. Anuraj, have a good night. Um, and yeah, let's hope we're all more conscious as we get on with things. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Go well. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Hey, CC, it's Brian. Can you hear me still? Yes, can you hear you? When is that conversation, the, the lecture you were talking about, the one on the uh, imagination, the architectural design? When, when okay, so that's next Tuesday, same time. Beautiful. I am definitely going to be in that one. It sounds amazing. Thank you. I hope it will be. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'm supposed to be playing music as an outro, but I, I've just given up. I can't quite figure out. Stop over. Somebody else. We'll just have okay, to. Everyone. Thank you. We will. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Ah, okay. It's us at last. Have you stopped the recording? I think whoever's recording needs to stop it. Maybe Kumo.